speaker today is someone who needs no introduction, Bruce Shelton. We all know Bruce, we esteem him as senior pastor, we love him as musician, teacher, counselor, and friend, Bruce. Well, good morning, everybody. As is my tradition, I would uh, like to ask you to help me with this talk uh, by if we could all just become quiet just for a few moments and I would ask that we all invoke the presence of God to speak through me, to talk through me this morning, to say exactly the words that you need to hear. So we can all just be silent just for a few moments. So thank you, Lord. Okay. Today, we're going to take a look at the life of St. Francis of Assisi. Uh, today is... Uh, St. Francis Feast Day, it's very appropriate for the, to have an animal here. Now my talk is complete. Uh, but uh, let's see, St. Francis, uh, he at a day St. Francis Feast Day is being celebrated by the Catholic Church, the Episcopal Church, and many other spiritual uh, centers in the world. Uh, St. Francis had a huge impact upon the uh, church of his time. Uh, only two years after he died, he was declared, he was canonized by the Catholic Church and declared a saint. Uh, you know, we all know that very often to be declared a saint uh, by the Catholic Church, it takes centuries. And uh, uh, he was just two years after he died. So you can, that tells us a little bit about the impact he had upon the church and the, and the people of Italy during his time. Uh, St. Francis uh, founded the uh, Order of Minor Friars, uh, the, the, excuse me, Friars Minor. Uh, his order, he wanted to make sure that everybody understood that the, the monks in his order were a little bit less than the monks in all the other orders. One of his big teachings was about humility. <laughs> so his, his friars are called Friar Minor. Uh, he also uh, founded the uh, Woman's Order of the Order of St. Clair. He was just as concerned about helping women as he was about men. Now that was, that was, really, that was not normal back in, in 13th century Italy. Uh, but he wanted to help the women as well, and Clare was, was a very dear friend of his, of his. He was declared the patron saint for animals and the environment, and nature. Uh, that beautiful uh, poem, Canticle of the Sun, that uh, Dick read this morning is, is an example of his love of nature. And he's also one of the two patron saints of Italy. So this all happened during his lifetime. Uh, and the question is, why? What, what was about St. Francis that made him so special? There's been, there are lots of wonderful spiritual enlightened beings in the, in the Christian church. Uh, what made Francis kind of stand out? Uh, one of his uh, biographers, a man named Paul Sabatier, uh, said that he felt like Francis was highly influenced by 2 Philippians uh, chapter 2. In that we read that, he, this is Paul speaking of Jesus. Uh, Paul says, he uh, being, uh, he felt it not robbery to be, make himself equal with God. He emptied himself of everything within him that separated him from God the Father. So this whole, t this whole teaching of emptying my head, emptying my mind, making space for, the, for spirit to just flow through me. St. Francis really understood that. Uh, and uh, he said he, that had a huge impact upon him. The, the, the uh, Greek word for 
for uh, emptying, it, by the way, is kenosis, and that was the word used in the uh, you know in the Greek tra Greek translation, uh, Greek original Greek. Uh, G uh, Paul, excuse me, uh, Francis said that the only thing that he really desired in his life was to imitate the life of Jesus. Uh, this was his whole thing, was just trying to make himself as, as much of a, a model for people in his time as Jesus was in people in his time. So when Jesus said to do something, he took him at his word. When Jesus said to the disciples, have neither gold nor silver nor brass in your purses nor, nor scrip for your journey, neither two coats, neither shoes. He took Jesus at his word. He told his disciples, and he, for, of course for himself, you cannot possess money. You cannot have money at all. The only time you could have money would be if you needed some money to pay someone to help heal a leper, you know, or to provide food maybe for somebody that was very sick. That's the only time you could have money. Now, this is a rather extreme teaching, <laughs> even for 13th century, century Italy, because they use money just like we do. Uh, but n none of his people could have money. You, can't, you couldn't, in his order, even have a book. He says, you don't need books. You just need to pray and meditate and have that personal relationship with God. Then you'll know everything that you need to know. <laughs> so he was, he was rather extreme, but his sincerity won everybody over. Uh, let's do a brief bio on him. Uh, he was born in the year 1182 in Assisi, Italy. His dad, his, his given name was Giovanni di Pietro di Bernardoni. <laughs> I'm glad there's no Italians here to tell me if I'm saying that right. Uh, but he was uh, born the son of a uh, very successful and wealthy cloth merchant. And uh, uh, being the son of a, of a wealthy man, he had all the, all, everything a young, uh, young man could have uh, when he became a a teenager, he, like all the other kids and all the other guys his age, uh, he, he reveled a lot. He had a, a life of wine, women, and song. Uh, if you want to know what I'm talking about, just go to Atlantic Avenue on any summer Saturday night and you'll see what I'm talking about. You'll see all the kids out there reveling, enjoying themselves. That was his life. Then when he reached age 21, things changed. At age 21, war occurred between Assisi and a neighboring city called Perugia. They both went to battle. Uh, Francis went, went to battle as a knight and uh, the war did not go well for Assisi. Assisi lost the, lost the battle and the good news was St. Francis survived. Uh, the bad news was he was taken prisoner. He was held prisoner for 12 months uh, in a medieval prison uh, and until his dad could come up with enough money to ransom him to bring him back to Assisi. Now anyone who's ever been to prison knows that it's a terribly, uh, it's a horrific experience. It's, it, it's to imagine ourselves being locked up in a cage for 12 months and that's, that's what prison, any prison is like that. And so I think that's when he first, pain, you know, the suffering he experienced from that is what caused him to look beyond, I think he started thinking there's more to life than what I've been seeing so far. Uh, who am I? What's it all about really, you know? And, uh, and I think that's when he started to have the beginning of his awakening experience began, when he actually started probably most likely for the first time praying very sincerely to God to deliver him from this suffering he was experiencing. Uh, now, he uh, came back home and uh, many of you may remember that great movie that came out in 1972 by Franco Zeffirelli called Brother, Son, Sister, Moon. That was a classic. I, I re-saw that recently and it's just as good now as it was back then. But you may remember from that movie, he came back home, he was very ill and uh, he was not the same. He got, got through the illness, but he was not the same. Uh, he, 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 this is when the estrangement with his father began. He just couldn't, didn't have it within him now to get excited about this family business. His dad really wanted him to take it over. He, he could not get into it, you know, from that, you may remember from that movie, his dad treated the, uh, uh, his, the people working there like slaves, it really was very abusive. He could not get into that. So 
he uh, spent as much time as, as he could away from his father out in, out in the woods, out in the hills, and he had a lot of time for personal reflection, right? But so he still hadn't quite, wasn't clear quite what it was all about yet, uh, what his life was all about. And two years later, he's, now he's 24 years old, uh, he, once again, the, the bugles start sounding and, and there's a call to war. And he goes out once again as a, as a knight. His dad got him the finest armor possible to make him shine. That The father wanted him to look good to the nobility. The dream of every knight and every person in the middle class there that, of which he was a member was to marry someone in the nobility. So the way to get ahead was to go to war, become a hero, come back. And uh, you might just win the right woman and become, become uh, join the nobility. So he goes, he, he goes out, of, he goes out of town to this, to this battle that was being fought, this war being fought in southern Italy. Uh, this battle, he was going to be on a side that was actually fighting for the Pope. So this is a much bigger war than just a war between two cities. But on the first night he was out, he had this vision. And nobody knows what the vision was, but it changed him. He says, I can't do this. You know, why, what, what am I doing, you know, going to war again? And he, he uh, on the third day, he, three days later, he returned to Assisi. And this was quite a, a, a scandal uh, for the family. You know, he was, he, the people in the city viewed him as a coward. And his father was just horrified that his own son had come back to town uh, as a coward, you know. And uh, his father just says, his father abused him, he beat him up, he, he would beat him, he locked him up in a closet some, several times. He became, the father became enraged when he found out that, he, that Francis was going out in the streets of Assisi and giving the money his dad had given him to the beggars on the street, just giving it away. So the dad finally says, I've had enough. You all might remember this from the movie. He, got St. Francis by the arm and just carried him before the bishop. By this time, there's a big commotion. The whole city now is gathering in the, the big plaza, the plaza. And uh, he says, the father says, I disown this son. He is no longer my son. I'm publicly proclaiming this before the bishop and the city. Well, Francis comes back and says, you know, we, we all remember this scene. He completely disrobed. He took his clothes, gave it to his father and said, I came into this world with nothing. You clothed me, fed me. Thank you, Father. I return to you now your clothes. Uh, you are no longer my father. I now have a new father. And everybody knew who he was talking about. And when he said that, he brought himself under the protection of the church uh, because now he had given himself to God, which automatically brought him under the protection of the, uh, of the church. Well, he left the city. Uh, he, he, now he's a beggar, uh, surviving with this little uh, bowl, uh, rice bowl. Uh, and he, but he found himself now uh, being attracted to these ruins outside the city called San Dimiano. And uh, this was an old Catholic church that had fallen into ruins. And he, he found himself going there every day and praying and meditating and asking Jesus and God to give him guidance and directions. What do I do now? Well, at this church, there was a crucifix uh, that was different than all the other crucifixes in other Catholic churches. Uh, we all know that in Catholic churches, they always have this crucifix with Jesus hanging from a cross with a crown, uh, crown of thorns and blood. And This crucifix was different, however. And his uh, first biographer, a guy named Paul Sabatier, he, des he described this crucifix like this. He says, in general, the crucified one, meaning Jesus, frightfully lacerated with bleeding wounds, appears to seek to inspire only grief and compunction. That of San Demiano, however, has an expression of inexpressible calm and gentleness. Instead of ch closing the eyelids in eternal surrender to the weight of suffering, it looks down in self-forgetfulness and its pure, clear gaze says, not I suffer, but come to me. So this is, isn't that interesting? Come to me. And at this time, he, through his prayers, Jesus did come to him in a vision. And Jesus says, yes, you're, you're my beloved brother. I love you. 
Uh, I will protect you, I'll guide you. And he ended, this vision ended by Jesus saying, rebuild my church. So Francis is there, they called him Francesco, was there and looking at the ruins he's in, he says, okay, I will, I'll rebuild this church. Now in retrospect, we know that what the real message was rebuild my <coughs> church, <laughs> the full church. And uh, that's what he, uh, that, was the, that was the destiny. But he said, okay, I'm, at the moment I'm gonna build this church having no idea what, what, what was gonna follow that. And during this time, uh, people would come out and see him doing this, and if they, some of them thought he was crazy, but his sincerity and his love for God and his love for Jesus was so powerful that he started actually attracting people to help him rebuild this church. <laughs> and uh, so the story goes on from there, you know, uh, he goes before the Pope eventually, by this time he has a, a group of disciples, the guys that he used to revel with in, in Assisi as a teenager, they were his first disciples. He had 12 of them. And each one of them had a, an awakening experience just like St. Francis. Because uh, they, they, they just that's what kept them going was this real living relationship with, G, with God and with Jesus. And, uh, but they went before the Pope, uh, Pope Innocent III. Uh, he was uh, allowed to continue with his work. He received the blessings of the Pope, which was a really, really big deal. And the Pope gave him permission to create an order. Now, when he went back to Assisi, the people, uh, now that he had been blessed by the Pope, the people who had been thinking he might be crazy, they said, he can't be crazy, he was blessed by the Pope. And they started coming to him in, in big crowds now to listen to him talk and to his disciples. And people started actually saying, you know what, I actually want to give up everything just to be with you. And they, that's, they were his first friars. And uh, the church started to build. And the next thing you know, he had thousands of people uh, that, were, that wanted to uh, follow his teachings and his new monastery started popping up. He did not really want to have a big organization. You know, that was not his thing. And at a certain point, it became overwhelming to him. And he said, I gotta step aside. Uh, anybody who's ever, you know, just in our, on our own church or our little board of directors, it gets to be stressful sometimes. He had, you can imagine what it's like with him. He had all these thousands of people and, and monks, every, monks wanting to become, uh, people wanting to become monks in his order. Anyway, he couldn't handle it. And uh, so he stepped aside. And uh, another monk was, uh, another brother was appointed a head of the, head of the order. The first thing, by the way, that this, this new head of the order decided upon, because he was very much under the influence of the cardinal, was to do away with that rule saying you cannot have money, <laughs> which was very interesting. And that was terrifying to Francis, because Francis, what are, you, what are you going on? But at this point, he had lost control, and he also was very, very obedient to, the, to his superiors. Now, there was a uh, little uh, chapel uh, uh, another little chapel that was outside of uh, Assisi a couple of miles away called Ponciancola. Ponciancola uh, was a small little uh, chapel. It was actually smaller than this church. It was probably about the size of this wing right here. Uh, and that was his, and what his, one of his, his biographers said that was the cradle, right, of the Franciscan movement. That was really his headquarters. Uh, he, he was as simple as he could get it, right? <laughs> and uh, uh, the church reminds me so much of this church. I had the opportunity back in 1999 to do a personal pilgrimage to uh, Italy and spent three days at Assisi. I wanted to go by myself because I really wanted, by, when you go by yourself, you can kind of spend as much time as you want in prayer and meditation. You don't have to worry about the tour bus hon honking and saying it's time to go to the next museum, you know? So I spent three days at Assisi, and just like thousands and thousands of other people who are attracted to Assisi, it has a, it has a strong spiritual power now. Uh, I could just feel Francis, his energy. It was really wonderful. And uh, I went to this little, this little church, Ponce and Cola, and saw it, and it, was, uh, it was, reminded me so much of this church. You know, uh, Tom Baker one time somewhat famously uh, one time described our church as the donkey church. He meant it as a compliment and we took it, we've always taken it as a compliment. 
You know, we have a very Franciscan energy here. <laughs> you know, very humble. And uh, anyway, life goes on. That uh, the ge generation uh, uh, Francis had a short life. He died at age 44 in the year 1226. And, uh, and of course, it was short by our standards at that time. It was actually kind of normal. Uh, but when he died, his, his, his movement had really taken a foot. And like I said earlier, he was declared a saint only two years later. And uh, uh, that generation died, you know, as, as, as generations do. And the next generation came along. And a hundred years later, uh, these stories were all being told by orally about the, what these monks were like, what their lives were like. And it was, bit, but it was all oral. And this, so there was a man uh, named Ugolini Boniscambi, uh, who um, was one of the brothers. And he says, you know what? I want to write down all these stories. I want to capture these stories while they're still fairly accurate, you know? Because he knew what would happen with the centuries. It would it'd all be, it, it, history would, would uh, uh, affect this, the truthfulness of the, of the original story. So he took, he collected a whole bunch of stories and uh, put them together in a book called uh, The Little Flowers of Assisi, which I have here. And uh, I'm going to read to you one of the stories uh, from that book that I particularly like. Um, it's called How God Spoke to St. Francis Through Brother Leo. Uh, once in the beginning, once... Uh, I'm sorry, I had the wrong one. <laughs> Let me read this one. How St. Francis taught Brother Leo that perfect joy is only in the cross. Okay, so this is all about what perfect joy is. It says, one winter day, St. Francis was coming to St. Mary of the Angels from Perugia with Brother Leo, and the bitter cold made them suffer keenly. St. Francis called to Brother Leo, who was walking a bit ahead of him, and he said, Brother Leo, even if the friars minor in every country give a great example of holiness and integrity and good edification, nevertheless write down and note carefully that perfect joy is not that. So they walk along a little bit further uh, and uh, Francis once again says, uh, Brother Leo, even if, a even if a friar minor gives sight to the blind, heals the paralyzed, drives out devils, gives hearing back to the deaf, makes the lame walk and restores speech to the dumb. And what is still more, brings back to life a man who has been dead four days. Right, that that is not perfect joy. And going a bit further, the two guys are walking back to the monastery. It says, Francis says, Brother Leo, he says this in a strong voice, Brother Leo, if a friar minor knew all languages and all sciences and scripture, if he also knew how to prophesy and how to pr reveal not only the future, but also the secrets of conscious, consciences and, and minds of others, write down and know carefully that perfect joy is not in that. And as they walked on after a while, St. Francis called again forcefully, Brother Leo, little lamb of God, <coughs> If a friar minor could speak with a voice, he's really getting worked up here. Even if a friar minor could speak with the voice of an angel and knew the courses of the stars and the powers of herbs and knew all about the treasures in the earth and if he knew the qualities of birds and fishes, animals, humans, roots, trees, rocks, and waters, write down and note carefully that true joy is not in that. And going a bit further, St. Francis called again strongly, Brother Leo, even if a friar minor could preach so well that he should convert all infidels to the faith of Christ, write that perfect joy is not in that. You can see Brother Leo there trying to write all this down while he's walking. And when he had been talking this way for a distance of two miles, Brother Leo in great amazement asked him, Father, I beg you in God's name to tell me where perfect joy is. I can feel Brother Leo's energy there. So St. Francis responds and he says, that, okay, I'm going to tell you what perfect joy is. 
When we come to St. Mary of the Angels, soaked by the rain and frozen by the cold, and they're actually, you know, heading back to St. Mary of the Angels, and it's a cold, rainy day. Soaked by the rain and frozen by the cold, all soiled with mud and suffering from hunger. And we ring at the gate of the place, and the brother porter comes and says, angrily, angrily, who are you? And we say, we are two of your brothers. And he contradicts us saying, you are not telling the truth. Rather, you are two rascals who go around deceiving people and stealing what they give to the poor. Go away. And he does not open for us, but makes us stand outside in the snow and rain, cold and hungry until night falls. Then, this is a big if, if we endure all those insults and cruel rebuffs patiently without being troubled and without complaining, and if we reflect humbly and charitably that that porter really knows us and that God makes him speak against us, oh, Brother Leo, right, that perfect joy is in there. And the story goes on, he, I won't read the rest of it, but he has two more examples where they knock on the door again and, and uh, the porter comes and he's a brother and he says, and he's this, every time he's more angry. And the third time the brother comes out with a club and beats him and there's blood and he throws him out in the snow and they're gonna spend the whole night outside. And, uh, and bo uh, both times uh, Francis says, uh, this, is, this is perfect joy. Right? Now, you all may remember, some of you may remember this story. We did this as a, as a little, we actually did a skit on this back in 2015 where uh, several of us acted it out, acted this story out. It's very funny. I, I actually saw that again recently. It's, it's actually on YouTube if you want to check it out sometime. But uh, the, yeah, uh, Robert Krajinki played St. Francis and uh, the Brother Leo was uh, Lloyd and uh, the guy who got to play the bad guy in, in this, uh, which was the hardest, nobody wanted to be the bad guy, but Francis Spore, you know, bravely took on that role. And, uh, but it was, very, it was very funny to actually act this out. And uh, now, so when I first read this, and I think when the rest of us read this, we're thinking, you know, this is really, this is really not a good story, you know, because it's, it, it, we, we're thinking this is that typical uh, medieval, Catholicism, uh, where you, you suffer yourself, you beat yourself, and that's how you find God. So we're thinking that's what, that's what this is all about. And we think, we don't want to do this, you know. But the more I pray, prayed about it and meditated upon the meaning of this, a, a totally different meaning came to me, okay? Uh, the meaning of this story is that uh, you and I, we go through life, and uh, sometimes bad things happen to good people. You know, all of us have had bad things happen. We can call it bad things that have happened to us. Things that cause us to suffer, to feel a lot of pain. Maybe it was a relationship problem, a job problem, financial, health, whatever it may be. But we experience pain. And what Francis is saying is that if we empty ourselves of everything in our mind, every fear-based thought and feeling, we empty ourselves, which we do through the practice of daily prayer and meditation. If we do that, we allow there to be an opening, you see, for that space now to be filled with God so that there's nothing within us now but God. You see, that is called, what we call that in this church, Christ consciousness, you see, where God has completely taken us over and, and actually we realize our true identity, which is our oneness with, with God. So he's, Francis is saying, if we're only filled with God, there's nothing in us, you see, that can be hurt. No matter what happens, there's nothing in us to react with anger towards somebody who says something bad to us. There's only pure love. <laughs> and the attributes of God, of God some of the, the main attributes are love, joy, and peace. So if we're filled truly with the Spirit of God, and we're, no matter what happens, we're still going to feel that inner joy. Isn't that, isn't that a kind of a powerful teaching? You know, and, and uh, we all need to remember that, that teaching as we go through life, because we're not finished yet. <laughs> There's going to be continued challenges as we, as we, as we, as we continue uh, to, fin to complete this life. Now, I'm going to finish this talk with a uh, little vignette about, uh, actually, another great spiritual teacher, the Buddha. This is a very short. 
couple of minutes. But uh, the Buddha, uh, you know, he was in, he experienced his enlightenment on, that night under the Bodhi tree uh, when he was 36 years of age, and he lived until age 80. And, he, and during that time, he spent his whole time just going around the countryside preaching, just like Francis was doing, telling everybody. He, just like Francis, he gathered all these, these followers. And people would see the Buddha and they'd say, you know, it's not what he's saying that, that really impresses us so much, it's, it's who he is. His energy was so powerful. People would just be with him and feel good. And they kept, and he talked about nirvana. He says, this is what it's all about, is experiencing the state of nirvana, which is the exact same, just another word for Christ consciousness. <laughs> and uh, so the Buddha uh, did, was going around, and, but people would come up and say, Master, tell us, what is nirvana? Just tell us what it is. He would never answer, you know. He would just uh, uh, be silent. He might have a, a slight smile. And uh, the, uh, one day his, his top disciple uh, said, Master, is nirvana, is nirvana bliss? And the Buddha said, yes, nirvana is bliss. Nirvana is joy. With that, we'll end this talk. Thank you so much.